Labour Mass, like a small chicken day in Crinu Pibli Shad and Udros Polin Nacht and Heron, Crinu Pibli Dernacht and Lienshaw, Agus Marhorlin, and Kedu Crinu the Udros, uh, came, uh, came talked to Selena Griech, Agus, uh, Ni Eschkut, uh, Shing on Tev Shinde, Agus Nimur Ant, Sahort, uh, Doiv Shuder, Nudros, or Verdon, Agus Sagar de Shikana, uh, Ahor on Bunklak, er, Bunklok, or Will on Obersha Toka Anish. Uh, good afternoon, and you're very welcome to this final public meeting of uh, recording in progress of this year. Um, it, this is the seventh public meeting, I think, uh, of uh, this year, and it is the 100th meeting of the Policing Authority, a not insignificant step in the life of any organization. And it's important, uh, I think, to uh, record and acknowledge the work of those uh, on the authority, on the authority staff and in the Garda Shikana uh, that laid the foundations on which uh, today's work and all of our work uh, is is built. Um, without further ado, uh, oh, the agenda has as its first item the uh, Garda Shikana policing plan for 2022 and the commission is going to make some uh, introductory remarks and Deirdre Morris uh, is going to make a brief presentation and then uh, authority colleague Debbie Donnelly will uh, lead the questions on this. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, just a, a few comments uh, from myself in respect of the 2022 policing plan. Um, obviously, a very important document for us, uh, but we look to be commencing 2022 with still a degree of uncertainty surrounding um, uh, COVID-19 and undoubtedly 2021 and certainly the very er the early months of it was overshadowed by COVID-19. But I have to say throughout the year of 2020, uh, 2021 that our staff show great commitment and dedication uh, and, uh, and I think that our relationship with the community um, and, uh, and between our the, uh, the community and members in Garda Shikana was demonstrated to be one of our greatest assets. The focus of the policing plan 2022 will be on continuity in respect of developing and building that relationship. We want to positively engage with the, vun with the vulnerable and with minority communities, and that will be um, achieved through the rollout, the continued rollout of our community policing framework. We want to engage with uh, engagement with our diversity fora, more localised public attitude surveys and a, an increased uh, social media presence. And that's all about us gaining the confidence of communities to, provoke, uh, to both prevent and detect crime. We want to do more work around our operating model, we, and that's to create a more effective and efficient administrative structure and maximise the number of guardy and staff who are available then for operational and operational support type duties. And then Garda Shikana is completely committed to further incorporate human rights and cultural awareness into our policy and training at all levels in the organization. There's further investment in our ICT and in our finance and human resources capacity, again focused on making sure that our policing outcomes on the ground can be absolutely maximized. And we will continue then to develop our work of the Divisional Protective Services Units, backed up by the, the, Division, the Protective Service uh, a national branch at the centre, and this provides uh, a deeper understanding of some of the very traumatic crimes that our society faces and what then we might do to support victims and bring perpetrators to justice. I think one of the guiding principles for us throughout the COVID-19 pandemic is that uh, we are providing a policing service that's the very heart of what we do and that and that place and service is built on the trust between ourselves and the community that we serve. We've had to show great flexibility and resilience over the last couple of years, and I think we want to carry forward and with that flexibility and resilience into 2022. We want to make sure that our code of ethics is well embedded. We want to further develop our quality, diversity and inclusion strategy, and also next year we'll carry out a new cultural audit. But we're also very aware of the threats that we face, both in terms of national security and organised crime. Both of these areas have, have, have seen uh, rises in, or increases in the threats that we face. 
uh, particularly internationally, and we have to be in a position to respond to that. And our partnership then with other security services and other law enforcement agencies is very important in that regard. And again, 2022, we want to um, have a year of growth in terms of those relationships and the successes then that uh, we are able to enjoy in terms of preventing crime and indeed detecting those involved in organized crime. So if I might uh, hand over then to Deidre in respect just of the presentation. Thank you, Deidre. Thank you, Commissioner. So the purpose of this presentation is really just to provide a bit of additional context and background to the development of the 2022 National Policing Plan and to again touch on the areas that the Commissioner has just mentioned and to do, illustrate how they align with the objectives under our strategy for the next three years. So we move on to the next slide. The 2022 Policing Plan and our strategy statement for the next three years were developed um, by a working group under the leadership of Deputy Coxon and Deputy McMahon, with the membership of that group chosen carefully so that it contained a range of personnel of different ranks, grades and geographical locations. And that working group uh, undertook extensive internal and external consultation, which was then complemented by a horizon scanning exercise that also involved engagement with international police forces. So just to give a sense of the external consultation, that included engagement with government departments and NGOs, a survey on the Garda website, and also, um, apologies, a survey on the, the Garda website and a number of focus groups with um, focusing on minority groups and underrepresented groups in society. So out of that, we were left with a very rich source of qualitative and quantitative data from which we drew the strategy statement and also the policing plan. The high level targets were agreed by the group. And then we engaged with, further with each of the business areas to refine the targets, to talk about the milestones for 2022, and also to talk about indicators of success. And that very much represents a conversation that we're having internally about moving not just to talking about outputs, but also outcomes and the impact that this work will have. So what we settled on were 36 targets. And what I'm showing on this slide is how the high level areas that those targets speak to align with the pillars and enablers of the strategy statement. So just to touch on each very briefly, in terms of community policing, there's a focus on ongoing problem solving with communities through the role of the community policing framework addressing the harm caused by drug dealing in communities, uh, engaging with minority and vulnerable groups to better understand their needs and an ongoing focus on hate crime. In terms of tackling crime and preventative policing, there are targets that seek to proactively respond to crime at all levels from burglary and volume crime to serious and organized crime, and also a target around fraud and cyber enabled crime and building our capability in that regard. With respect to victims and the vulnerable, we are seeking to build on the work that we've already done through operative and the role of the DPSUs, and there'll be a continued focus on domestic violence and coercive control. That's going to be complemented by a target that will review the supports that we are offering to victims and the vulnerable persons in the context of independent recommendations and internal and external feedback. In terms of protecting the security of the Irish state, we continue our focus on being prepared for major emergencies and also proactively identifying disrupting terrorism. And in relation to achieving sustainable change and innovation, uh, the targets on the 2022 plan are a step towards a new conversation away from thinking about reform and transformation as something that has an end date, but rather recognizing that we will need to continuously adapt to meet the changing needs of society and the communities that we serve. And so there are targets there around change capacity um, and innovation strategy. Uh, strategically managing our resources and also an environmental sustainability plan. When we were developing the strategy statement and the pillars you see there, we recognized that in order to achieve our strategic objectives, we needed to have a number of enablers in place. And so the some of the targets on the 2022 plan further develop those enablers. So in relation to people and purpose, we remain committed to having a workforce that, ref that reflects the diversity in Irish society. And so we will be continuing to work on the diversity of recruitment. There will also be supports for our personnel in terms of the health and well-being strategy and continuing that rollout, and also training, learning, and development. 
Under partnerships, a continued ongoing commitment to engaging in the community safety pilots for piloting crisis intervention teams, but also looking at other opportunities to strengthen our service and effectiveness through collaboration with other departments, community groups, third level institutions, think tanks, etc. Under engagement, we mentioned the public attitude survey and other uh, avenues of getting a better understanding or continuing to develop our understanding of the needs of communities and also commitment to roll out a cultural audit to our own personnel. Um, under empowerment and trust, very much speaks to professionalism and behaviour, continuing to embed the code of ethics, the um, Garda decision-making model, continuous human rights training, roll out of the Garda anti-corruption unit and their strategy, integrity building, and complemented by the roll out of the operating model in the sense that it will help us to define structures, roles, and responsibilities. The continued investment in ICT through the 2022 roadmap will further enhance our capability in terms of information-led policing. And there's also a target there around the mobility devices. A significant number of our personnel now have a mobility device. And so the focus will shift to looking at the capabilities of that device and how we can, through app development or other means, uh, improve our efficiency and effectiveness. So we move on to the next slide. The work that we've done in the 20, uh, the targets for the 2022 plan are very much uh, building on the work that we've done under the last three years under the strategy, and particularly the 2021 plan. And there's a number of targets there that, that, that speak to that continuity, as the commissioner said, in terms of ongoing rollout of the community policing framework, off leash of GPSUs, diversity in the op model. There's also a recognition, as we've already said, that Irish society continues to change and evolve, and so we need to also continue to change. And so there's a number of targets that are more forward-looking, um, particularly building our capabilities around fraud and cybercrime, reviewing the supports that we're offering to victims, thinking about our sustainability. But particularly important to us is further strengthening the relationships with minority communities under the 2022 to 24 diversity and inclusion strategy. So that's a brief summary of, of the policing plan. Um, and I will hand back now if there's any questions. Thank you, Deirdre, and over to Debbie, who is going to deal with the questions. Thanks, Deirdre, and, and Commissioner, for, for that introduction and, and presentation. Um, and as an authority, we welcome the work that um, you and that working group has undertaken. Um, we know from earlier conversations the, the detail in which that, that um, was considered and the seriousness in which you have approached that work. Um, I have, um, throughout the year, we look forward to both at authority and within committees, um, having more detailed conversations about different aspects of that um, plan with you. But just to, um, to start off, I suppose what to say is that your reassurance um, around the continued um, work on community policing, um, and that really came to the four during the last, during cer certainly the, the pandemic emergency, um, is very welcome and will be very welcome for communities, as will your commitment to continuous operation FISHIV. And I'm I'm highlighting some just some aspects of, of this plan at the moment. Um, you know, because there may well be concern within communities that some of the, the work that was embedded during that time um, in supporting communities and those vulnerable might roll back a little bit so your reassurance today is is very welcome indeed um i, I want to, to mention a little bit about some of the the targets just to, to illustrate but can you say something at this point commissioner about the challenges and the risks that are presented for next year in the delivery of this plan well i think um some of the challenges still, uh, regrettably, are unknown. Um, we, we have to just wait to see what this latest resurgence of COVID actually means for us in terms of the um, early part of the year. But um, we had a very ambitious um, recruitment program for next year. And uh, one of the, the very real challenges as well is just the lag now that we have around training and how we uh, catch up on that. And that's a real um, organizational uh, risk 
uh, risk for us and some of the assumptions, the plan assumptions that we've made next year around both uh, training and recruitment, we're going to have to watch uh, very carefully. In effect, in terms of resourcing, we've pretty much been marking time now for the last uh, 18 months and really just um, in effect have been recruiting to, uh, to replace our, um, our cessations. I think the second thing I want to highlight is just, um, and I think it's appropriate to highlight it, uh, it's just a change in, an ongoing change in nature of uh, organised crime. And uh, in part, you'll see that we're having to invest more, particularly around cybercrime, because um, so much of organised crime, particularly frauds, uh, investment fraud or um, so-called romance fraud, but also um, the abuse of children online, um, has grown during the pandemic. That's an international uh, uh, phenomenon, and we haven't been spared from that as well. So it's to see where, now, where next organised crime goes. And then also then we have our own um, particular problems around uh, illicit drugs. And that's just an ongoing um, policing problem and, and also a major societal problem, which features every day. Uh, we put huge effort into that. So. Um, and then there are other, there are other threats uh, emerging in terms of national security. So I can see that being a risk into 2022 as well. So uh, I don't know that globally that we have come out well, and even if we have, if you can say we've come well out of COVID-19 or that we're out of COVID-19, I don't think you can, but the last two years have seen some areas uh, really um, Fall back and other and things like organized crime and the threat from terrorism uh, globally and the threat from international terrorism grow. So these are real sort of risks um, within our policing plan. But I would say, uh, in terms of Angarda Shikana, and if I was to put us um, on an international footing, we're very well um, placed in terms of our relationship with the community. That gives us a strong um, community policing focus. Uh, there's a lot of confidence in Angarda Shikana. We enjoy a lot of support from the public, and that's tangible support in terms of information that's provided to us. And that's a, that allows us to detect many serious crimes that perhaps in other jurisdictions uh, may not be as easily detected. But also, I think one of our main strengths, and having spent a bit of time looking out across you know, the whole international gambit of policing services, we have a very strong um, democratic foundation, a very strong foundation in human rights, a very strong foundation in terms of service delivery and service improvement and a strong foundation in terms of accountability. And these are all things that'll, that um, uh, are very important to us, but they're very important in terms of the policing service that we provide to the society as well. And I think we are in a fortunate position here in Ireland that we do enjoy these. Um, and there's many, many places elsewhere in the world where citizens don't enjoy the same relationship or the same relationship or, or the same complexity of relationship with their policing services. So there's a lot to be concerned about looking forward in the year ahead. There's a lot to be proud of in terms of where we are. And we want to build on that as well. I think we've done well in terms of the protective services, the focus on human trafficking, as well as domestic abuse, serious sexual assault, child abuse. Uh, but now there's other areas there that increasingly we want to focus on as well, um, child abuse online, but also the amount of fraud online as well. So um, crime's evolving, and we need to be always be keeping pace with that. Thanks, Deb. Hey, thanks, Commissioner, for that um, detailed response. Um, and indeed, um, you'll continue to be as busy and as productive as I'm sure you, you will want to be um, in the coming year. Um, I'd like to talk um, a little bit to you about some of the measures, but um, I think that we maybe take some of that conversation into committees um, in terms of the detail because of the, the, the timing today. But if I could just um, maybe ask you about one in particular, and it's around Operation Fisha. Um, you, 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 have, you and your officers have met um, it's not a target, but I suppose an aim of 80% um, call back within seven, seven days. Can you say, tell us something about that 80% and because it leaves 20% not responded to. 
And I suppose the question that we'll have um, on this and, and others is the extent to which you believe that is remains a stretching um, target or and comment on the 20% which um, victims that you're not able to contact within that seven days. Well, um, I do think a callback, particularly when that time limit is is a is a stretching target, um, and it's only a few years ago that that target was bumping along at about twenty uh, percent. So, like, it's a huge uplift that was achieved really last year when we put an increased focus uh, upon domestic abuse, and the power of that is that um, we've maintained in effect a victim-centered approach and uh, we're reaching out to victims and giving them confidence to further report should, uh, should they uh, necessarily do so. But they're also talking to staff then um, who are uh, trained and experienced in dealing with domestic abuse and then are able to determine should any further action be taken in place. So it is important to do, it's, um, uh, it's important that it's follow, followed through on. Uh, the 20% is just, I think some of it's about timing uh, but there is an element then of people being transient and being difficult actually to track down again, and that's uh, a, a feature of this as well. I think it would be impossible to, to meet the 100%, but 80% um, uh, is, uh, is a significant target and uh, one we are committed to and, and um, pretty much at times have exceeded, uh, uh, but at other times I find, it, I find 80% to be very stretching. Commissioner, thank you very much, and we look forward to further conversations. Chair, over to you again. Thank you. You're, yeah. This is refusing to unmute. Thank you very much, Debbie, um, and uh, thank you, Commissioner, also for those contributions. The next element uh, on the agenda is the um, question of the CAD 999 um, uh, issue, and the publication of the uh, today of the preliminary uh, report by uh, uh, Derek Penman. Um, I think it might be useful very, very briefly uh, to recall a, a number of key figures uh, in this uh, issue, in this story. In the period that was reviewed of the 1.4 million calls uh, to 999 that were passed on to the Garda Síochána. Uh, somewhere over 200,000 uh, of the those incidents were cancelled or closed, whatever terminology you wish to use. Uh, and that's about one in eight uh, of, uh, of those calls. And of those, um, 23,000 were priority one calls. And of those, just over 3,000 related to domestic violence and sexual abuse. And when it became clear uh, to the Garda Síochána back in just over a year ago uh, that he was a major issue uh, that needed to be uh, addressed, they quite properly chose to focus on those domestic violence and sexual uh, abuse calls our incidents together with those that related to uh, missing persons or health emergencies. Uh, and that came to a total of just over 5,000 calls. So that 5,000 was 3% of the total number that were, that were uh, cancelled or closed and just over 25% of the priority one calls. I say that not to diminish the significance of this in any way, because there may be a tendency to see that declining funnel as being an indication that this is a this is a, a a narrow issue. Rather, the reverse to say that there is still seventy five percent of the priority one calls that have not been reviewed, and none of the priority two and priority three. Now, it's not going to be the case that each will have the same forensic. Uh, approach that the that this group of calls had, but it's an important point to remember in this. Because of the 
significance that the authority attached to this issue because of the recognition of the risk to the to individuals, to the Garda Síochána, to people's confidence in the 999 call process. Because of the, to be frank, the long delay that we had in getting a fuller understanding from the Garda Síochána of the full extent of the issues that were involved, and principally so as to provide a level of assurance to the authority, to the commissioner, and very importantly to the public, that these issues were fully understood and that all of the implications were being extracted from the information that was available and that there was a complete understanding of any consequences that might have arisen. The authority decided to commission an external independent evaluation and review of the work undertaken thus far. And this preliminary report is the first phase of that response from Derek Penman, who is a former head of the um, uh, Her Majesty's Inspector of Constabulary in the Con Inspectorate of Constabulary in Scotland, as well as having been uh, an experienced police officer uh, for over an extended uh, period of time therefore entirely suited to the task. Uh, this report is the first step. It identifies approaches that require to be taken in relation to those other calls that have not been reviewed. And at least it opens up a possibility of identifying that way. And clearly, when the legal inhibitions that have been identified by the Garda Shikona as a barrier to the ability to listen to calls when that has been or they have been resolved, well, then it would be possible to have a more definitive uh, report uh, uh, in respect of this review. That is simply by way of a, a background and an underlining of the fact that the authority attaches very significant and continuing importance to this work, as I know does the commissioner and his senior colleagues, uh, and also to identify the fact that the underlying risk that this revealed uh, has not gone away and is a matter of great significance. Uh, always was, is now, and any uh, recurrence would constitute such into the future. Um, I, I now would think the commissioner, invite the commissioner to make some uh, 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 response or some, uh, not to what I've said, but perhaps to uh, Mr. Penman's report, and then uh, Moling, Ryan, and Shalom Binchy in that order will lead on the questions to the Commissioner on this topic. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Chair. Um, just a very short comment uh, in respect and, uh, of Mr. Penman's report and to welcome his report. Uh, but firstly, I would just wish to uh, reiterate my apology of June um, and just uh, entirely accept that uh, Times and Garda Shikana did not provide the standard of service to the victims of domestic abuse that is set out in our policies and which they were entitled to um, expect from us. We, as a result of that, and then Garda Shikana have taken this matter with the uh, the utmost seriousness, and this is demonstrated, I think, by the large number of system uh, performance management, supervision and governance improvements that we've introduced uh, following the discovery of this issue last year. Uh, we are absolutely committed to rebuilding trust, and I want to thank Mr. Penman for his work, which will greatly assist us in that process. As you've said yourself, Chair, Mr. Penman, uh, is an expert in this area and uh, we welcome uh, his findings and his advice and suggestion in terms of what is written not only in the recommendations but which is also then laced uh, throughout the report in terms of uh, uh, various uh, prompts about further actions to be taken. Um, we are pleased to note that uh, he finds that Angarda Shikana did react promptly to the issue when it first emerged in late 2020. Uh, and that we have conducted a very um, detailed and systematic and indeed victim-focused review that has prioritised the most 
vulnerable of uh, the victims that we were dealing with. And um, I'm also glad to see that we, when we have been dealing with the most vulnerable, that Mr. Penman has found that we've been, been not only just consistent nationally, but also have uh, illustrated a compassionate approach to our victim engagement, which has been conducted by our experienced staff. Uh, we welcome the recommendations, uh, 13 recommendations, many of which are already in the process of being implemented, but inevitably with uh, recommendations, there are also there some which are medium to long term and require uh, further uh, investment. But um, we still remain committed to the, um, uh, the process that we've engaged upon. Uh, you've rightly mentioned the other level one incident incidents and uh, we're working through what our methodology would be in respect of that. Uh, again, um, picking up on some of Mr. Penman's uh, recommendation, uh, but I'll take uh, into account the, the considerable public um, concern that's been expressed uh, in respect of this issue. And uh, we hope that Mr. Penman's report provides some reassurance to the public as to our initial approach, what we've done since then, and also then we can provide ongoing uh, uh, confidence to yourselves as the policing authority about what our approach is going to be, and also then uh, how we see this developing in terms of the new uh, CAD to command and control and uh, contact system. So uh, I will I will conclude my comments with that and. Um, Look forward then to the discussion. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. And over to Moling, who begins. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Chair, and thank you, Commissioner, for um, for for those um, for those observations and uh, identifying the steps that have taken that the uh, Garda have taken since uh, you were informed of, uh, of of this of this of this particular issue um I'll be it and that from the perspective of the policing authority we feel we should have been uh, informed um considerably earlier than we were but if I might from I, I, I gather from from your observations um uh, commissioner um that uh, you don't demur um, or you don't have any reservations in 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 relation to um, the findings uh, from Mr. Penman's uh, report, or indeed from the recommendations that he's proposed, that you're happy to uh, move those towards implementation. Um, well, uh, we only have uh, well we've received this final report in in Ferns in the in the last number of days, but we had we'd seen in, uh, the draft a few weeks ago and have made. Um, uh, and made some response. I would like the opportunity to provide, in effect, almost like a, an official management response to the to the overall document. But uh, and and I say that because, in respect of the recommendations, uh, some are already underway. Some are are uh, recommendations that uh, we will look then towards um, uh, implementing. But uh, some are, I suggest, medium term to long term and. And require us to consider a uh, really um, a local station in effect call management processes. We put it like that. Like uh, Mr. Penman flags up uh, what he regards to be weaknesses in that approach, uh, and uh, we want just to consider that because um, to take that recommendation, just say, well, we accept that. Ultimately, then that starts to lead you down the line of non-emergency numbers, etc. And whereas um, we provide a service which is uh, in many places very locally based and people do take comfort in ringing their local guard station and speaking to a guard that they know. So uh, there's a balance there for us um, and there's a balance just in the, in the manner in which we are providing a local policing service and we haven't fully considered that to its conclusion. So I can't say that all of the, all of the recommendations would inevitably then um, be policy for us. There's many of the recommendations that we do accept and indeed are on, our, are on the way to implementing. Uh, some of them are more medium to long term and even the recording of calls coming into local stations, I think there's probably a legal impediment in respect of doing that at this present time as well. So um, uh, there's, there's certainly considerable work needed in respect 
of, of some elements of some of the recommendations. Uh, thank you for that, Commissioner. So I anticipate that you'll have a response in relation to each of the recommendations, some of which you anticipate uh, you'll be in a position to implement more or less immediately, and others you anticipate that there'll be longer term implications. And I appreciate it, and nor do my colleague, my, my colleague Shalom uh, Binshi will um, certainly be addressing the issue of technology where there may well be a necessity for further investment and, and, and focused and focused investment. But if I might maybe just just get our conversation on the way a little bit by 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 looking at you know firstly firstly briefly in terms of in terms of what happened over a particular period of time um, and indeed of concern to us was where was the fact that some of the practices seemed to continue even after after their discovery and their communication across 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 the organization. But just just overall, in, in terms of you and your management team, what do you think, or how do you think this particular extensive aberration occurred or was allowed to develop over a period of time and appeared to develop right across uh, on a national level across each of the control areas, control centers? Uh, you're, you're talking about the period 19 to October 2020. Correct. Yes. Yeah. So, um, well, I think there's a number uh, of uh, elements uh, in respect of that. I think uh, one is the uh, the pressure of work. Um, secondly, then I think it was people's um, desire to clear and and affect their screens uh, on uh, unwarranted um, shortcuts. Then uh, were being taken, and the reconciliation process around checking on council calls was not being followed uh, through on. So I think there was a behavioural piece and then a lack of, um, in effect, checking through and the governance um, around the command control procedures are really at the, at the heart of this. Um, uh, many of the calls, uh, well, in fact, no calls that we received uh, went unanswered. What happened then was then when they were converted to incidents, then incidents were being uh, cancelled uh, in effect around this this high risk group in particular that we have such a good knowledge of uh, at times incorrectly, and that's where our that's where our problem lies. Uh, that this that, that um, these practices were happening in terms of um, as has been said already, some some five thousand of the. Priority one calls were, um, or sorry, in respect of the uh, calls relating to domestic violence, um, missing persons, and um, health, etc. So it's 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 difficult to just put your to be definitive on exactly what the problem was. I think it was a combination of problems, um, and uh, this this in effect developed over a period of time was on this and they in effect undiscovered by our governance procedures yeah I, I i think you're i think i'm certainly taken by your observation of it being um it being a behavior um uh, issue and some might observe that it's a cultural issue and um, particularly in terms of it in in terms of it and um, being quite pervasive um and and um and because i i i, I you know, probably, probably um, wouldn't put the entire um, the entire fault or blame at supervision because one expects one expects um, um, uh, some appropriate appropriate action um, at at an individual level. But maybe a question that does immediately present itself is: Are you concerned, or is your senior management um, concerned, and that you may have this exactly the same um, uh, incidence of events? At a local station level, um, uh, in acknowledging the fact that the difficulty of confirming that uh, is 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 um, uh, made more difficult or significantly more difficult as a consequence of of um, those calls not being recorded. Well, um, we're in a position from the first of January twenty nineteen that the travel nine calls were all coming into four control centers as opposed to 16. So there's far greater insight into those travel nine calls. And also then that all, all calls uh, for assistance uh, were to be uploaded and should be put onto CAD and therefore then um, resources allocated to deal with those calls. So from January, 2019 um, processes have become um, tighter. It's very difficult actually to say uh, what was happening at local stations. 
um, because we can't, in effect, check back on the calls that were assistance that uh, were received. Uh, we have no we have no recordings of those calls, so we were dependent on individuals locally and in, in each of the stations uploading incidents onto CAD. Mr. Penman has highlighted that as being a, a weakness, and that's something now that we want to. Um, uh, okay. further consider and then see how we might address that. But it's one of the outturns of this overall work where we started on one area of Treble Nine, uh, Treble Nine calls is it's opened up into other aspects of our command control strategy and uh, how we make sure that um, we don't in effect uh, have this sort of problem again or something similar to it. Can I address the, 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 the front line of supervision in, in the in the control rooms, if I might, for, for a moment? And I'm, I'm, I'm looking at, at um, uh, Derry Penman's, um, Terry Penman's report, and, and he points there's two, two, relevant, two relevant findings um, where he says policies and procedures were in place that should have identified unwarranted cancelled incidents. And this would suggest that supervision, quality assurance checks and procedures for the performance management of individuals within regional control rooms and local stations were either not followed or not effective. And it also, it also, um, uh, it, it also, it also says a discovery of additional non-compliant, the discovery of additional non-compliant CAD instance in September 2021, which as you know, was um, the subject of our discussion at the last, at the last authority meeting where we were particularly concerned that despite despite what had happened and despite the discovery that there were further further um, inappropriately cancelled calls discovered. But it also says that um, quality assurance checks and the performance management of individual members um, within the DMR and the other three regional control rooms is weak and this presents a serious ongoing risk. So what this seems to be saying definitively that the quality and element of supervision um, within those control rooms was, was weak that there were significant faults in, in, in relation to it. At the same time, Mr. the report also says that the training is very comprehensive and covers all the areas that might reasonably be expected to be expected to cover. And yet, this, despite that, um, the, 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 uh, the, the, uh, we're now left with a significant uh, failure in service to um, very often very vulnerable members of society. Um. Well, it's hard to know how to respond to those uh, those comments because hiddenly something went wrong. So, and we acknowledge that we acknowledge that something went wrong. What we what we want to do now is make sure that we have in place the systems um, uh, of supervision and governance around this to try and minimise the risk of this happening again. I might I might just turn to ACO Brand just in a, in a minute, just around those new uh, processes. But I would say, um, you know, right from the start, I think all of us have been shocked because we put so, so much emphasis through the protective services bureaus and through on the callback processes as well on the whole area of domestic abuse. That, that was sort of one of the central planks of what we wanted to do in 2019. And yet we had these behaviours which were really pointing um, the other direction from where the organisation wanted to go. So, um, and, uh, so there was a disconnect between what the organisation was saying, what it was wanted to do, how it was training people, and how it was putting those resources, and then ultimately some of the behaviours that we've seen. But um, at least uh, we have this report, and it does give us a roadmap for a way through this, and also then how we develop the new system in terms of CAD two. But if I could just turn to Barry around specifically uh, issue of the supervision and governance that's ongoing now, Barry, please. If I might supplement that, that to, to, to Barry just, be, just, before he re, just before he replies, because maybe my observation might might help him to, to have a, maybe a more more comprehensive response. But I might may, maybe say at the outset, I know you said something something went wrong and you probably didn't didn't mean to understate it because quite a significant a significant um, um, element went wrong, which 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 was which was quite pervasive and and um, had, had has had a, has had a significant impact. But my concern again, if I if I might address the assistant commissioner um, in relation to this, that we've been focusing on on um, the the people taking the calls and we've been focusing on the supervision, but there are various levels above that. Um, there's the there's the middle management element of it, and obviously there's the there's the singer right up to the um, at assistant commissioner level at regional level, and 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 beyond that. Um, 
was there any sense that this particular area uh, was was recognized as a risk? Um, this this particular practice or these practices seem to have been going on for a significant period of time. Um, did did the individual say, um, um, assistant commissioners or did the individual chief superintendents or super superintendents recognize that there was a risk there um, that that calls were not being adequately taken or not responded to uh, to a significant to a significant extent? Um, and if 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 they if they didn't, why 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 was it not part of the determination of of the relevant risks within the organisation? Um, yes, um, uh, Mr. Chair and uh, Clarity. In respect of, of the risk, um, we we have been looking. Now, we since the inception of the control rooms, there were a number of actions undertaken in terms of kind of oversight and, and, and review. Um, this this incident was, as you rightly point out, was identified in in, in the November of, of 2020. And I suppose one of the things is that cancellation is actually a legitimate appropriate activity in certain circumstances. So uh, I, my assessment is that within that, this cohort was, was uh, out of activity was operating. So it's not as if we say a cancellation isn't something that the system does, doesn't allow. So, you know, it's a fair point to say that we, it, you know, it, that we didn't pick up the risk at an earlier juncture and that, and that, that is, a, is a very fair observation. But I suppose when we, once we, pick, once we identified the risk, then we started. We put in the, the the procedures in place, and and some of the safeguards that we have put in, uh, some of them the commission has alluded to, uh, they cover kind of three areas: the the technical solution, uh, the behavioural, and the procedural. And we've t undertaken a number of those. So, for example, in the technical area, there have been a number of technical adjustments to the existing uh, CAD system to actually uh, to significantly reduce. The uh, the opportunity to cancel calls without a supervisory review, in the area of supervision, in addition to we say the supervision supervisory aspect of it, we also introduced uh, an inspection and review process. I have uh, and this involves similar to what we would do in other areas of policing, whereby the level of inspector or superintendent in charge of the section would conduct uh, monthly or bi-monthly inspections of various aspects of the system to ensure that uh, that our processes and procedures are, are, are being adhered to. With regards to the behavioural side of it, we've introduced um, a, a level of training specifically addressing the issue of risk and identifying risk from call takers in particular scenarios or particular environments, for example, domestic violence, because uh, one of the explanations is that the individuals who were processing the calls didn't fully appreciate the potential risk associated with some of these events. Uh, and as a consequence, then our training program, we, we did a specific focused piece of training on all of the uh, personnel in respect of that. So there's a number of areas that we've been endeavouring to mitigate this. I, I, I appreciate that. I appreciate that, um, Assistant Commissioner. That efforts have, have have been made, and I've noted, I've noted in in Derek Penman's report um, that there were a whole series of um, memos and directives um, to to various people in relation to the appropriate action to be taken for calls and cancellation of calls, and related to everything from taking a fix and so on. Um, is is there is there a danger, Assistant Commissioner, that really what was happening here was was that it was management by memo? And that, and that once a memo or a directive issued, that it was presumed to be in place and to be followed, where is quite clearly it wasn't or hasn't been. Uh, no, I wouldn't accept that um, because, in addition to the instructions, we are, you know, the the system generates management information reports that are given then that are sent to each of the assistant commissioners, who in turn disseminate them, uh, examine them, and see if there are issues in those, that information. So it's not simply a case of just issuing a memo or instruction. We have been following up in respect of our review process and our inspection and review process. And the reports that the system generates, albeit not as at the level as we would like, but that is being used as a tool by which we are we are monitoring that, including were, were the these were these management re, were these management reports issuing um, every quarter? Um, were, were were they coming to the individual assistant commissioners? And if so, how were they being interrogated? 
Yeah, they, they're, they're completed on a monthly basis and they're given to the assistant commissioners and it covers a whole uh, significant areas of the performance of the CAD system, including things like at scene times, response times, yeah. log on details, cancellation details and that. So they were they're being provided on a monthly basis. And would it, would it not then appear back to my earlier point that that uh, there was a presumption on your on your part that the direction of directives or the are they the memos that you had is, issued were were being utilized effectively were being implemented and put in place effectively but weren't and, no, you didn't, not and did you and did you have a process where 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 whereby you could challenge some of those matters or the people the people who might have been reporting to you or the person reporting to um two levels two levels below might have interrogated these points and asked questions or or, or identified where issues were arising well, certainly it wasn't a presumption on my part in respect of uh, these instructions uh, being carried out or not being carried out. That was also followed up. And then you must also recognise that uh, in addition to this, we were, part, we were on, undergoing the current review and the key personnel in that review process were the levels of management within each of the control rooms. And I think as Eric Penman has said in his report, I think there's up to 31 such meetings where all of the issues in respect of the cancellation calls were being dealt with, were being reinforced in respect of the review. So there will be uh, the personnel who have that responsibility at mid management certainly were under no doubt as to what the requirements are. So it's not just the issue of the memo, there's a lot of other things being undertaken, including a number of adjustments to the system and procedural adjustments on an ongoing basis. Now, the Commissioner spoke um, earlier in terms of working to restore the trust of the public uh, in, in relation to how 999 calls are being dealt with and indeed people with people, that not, not everybody who make 999 calls, but particularly those in uh, challenging or difficult situations and reference was made to domestic violence and, 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 and assault um, and, and, and so on. And, and, and my, my question really is in ahead of the you're, you're close to finalization of your preliminary examination. Um, how assured can the authority be um, that the steps that are now in place or will be in place will obviate or at least minimize the chances of a recurrence of such interest? And if I, if I might, maybe before you respond to that, I, I would have asked the same question a number of months ago. And then, but since then, we we then had reports of a recurrence of inappropriate cancellations. So you can see that the, the difficulties and the challenges that the authority are facing in, in in terms of in terms of assurance. How how reassured can we be at this juncture? Uh, okay. Well, in respect of the the additional reports which referred to the category of Intel or which replaced information, and the uh, the other category cancellation, that is currently under review. So we haven't finalised that all of those are even what proportion of those were actually incorrectly cancelled. So without kind of presuming that all of those were cancelled, we're still in the review stage of that. And, and bearing in mind the, the, the numbers that we, we, we are looking at that require further review, those numbers are quite small. That's not to say that they are not significant in that every such call would be of a concern. So uh, with regards to an assurance, I can, I can give you an assurance that uh, the, uh, the, the focus of all layers of management in Angard Shikana is very much on uh, the uh, call and dispatch uh, feature. That's not to say there may there may not be an issue, but that's a, the assurance I can give you that the focus of the organisation's attention is very much on this subject matter. Yeah, I mean you're, you're quite you're quite right to emphasise the fact that um, behind every call um, is a human being and an individual, and a considerable number of those people are encountering are encountering problems of, of 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 significance in relation to that and the reassurance that that that, that um you, you you you're giving us or will be giving us and indeed and indeed the public to what extent have you um engaged with um with members with experience of control rooms or who currently work in control rooms to identify current or ongoing or future cad vulnerabilities are you speaking of control rooms in this jurisdiction or oh, in this jurisdiction? In this, in this jurisdiction, I guess, yes. Right. 
Well, the the review of the uh, CAD was undertaken by the by the personnel within the control rooms who have the expert knowledge, both at Garda, Sergeant and Inspector level. So that is part of the ongoing engagement, uh, you know, and we, you know, and I have enlisted uh, the advice in addition as part of our CAD 2, we would have all of our national experts involved in the practicality and the operations of CAD and they have been engaged in respect of the design of CAD 2. So there has been an extensive level of engagement, not alone in regards to the review that we are that we are undertaking, but also in preparation for the introduction of CAD 2 and how that will, will operate. So there is extensive engagement and will continue right up to the, um, the actual introduction of CAD 2. We have what we identify as super users who would be the national experts in the operation of CAD. Uh, and also they are identified as key personnel that are assisting in the design of our processes and procedures. So our designs, it's very much expert-based rather than level of rank in the organization. Um, you now, before I hand back to the chair and to Shalom, um, if I might, maybe you might briefly uh, give us some indication of um, the proposed next steps in relation to the remainder of the priority one cases and indeed the priority two and priority priority three cases of recognizing um, that Derek Penman in his in his report um, endorsed the approach that you were taking in terms of a risk based risk a risk based uh, a risk based approach. But we in the authority are certainly interested in the steps you take and also the timelines um, when you might expect an, an outcome. Okay, in respect of the the seventeen thousand or so. Uh, priority one cases, they were also subject of the initial review that was undertaken and there was an examination of, of, of those in order to identify what, what, what calls needed to be undertaken. Now, in addition to that, what we are doing is with the assistance of our analyst service is revisiting that review and in particular looking at ways in which we can identify particular calls are areas of, of concern. So that process is currently underway. I can't be too prescriptive about it, but uh, you can rest assured that that piece of work has been undertaken. And, and the, the, the work that we had done in respect of that uh, was outlined to, to, to Mr. Penman and what we had kind of our thoughts around how we address that was also outlined. So that's generally the, the area where we're, we're looking at in respect to the priority one. We haven't considered what to do with respect to priority two and three. Again, uh, with regards to timelines, uh, our anticipation in terms of cleaning, clearing off all of the work with our current review, I would anticipate will be concluded by a year's end in terms of the reconciliation of uh, CAD instance to PULSE. Uh, the, the sign off of the contact with victims. Uh, there's also a parallel process in respect of um, performance and discipline that will be further down the track. Uh, and once we have that situation, then we will be looking at Mr. Penman's report and also our own insights as to what are the issues and what we need to address that hasn't already been addressed. Thank you, Assistant Commissioner Chair. Thank you, Maureen. Can I pass over to Shalom Binchy, please? Thank you, Chair. Um, if I could just start by asking some questions around the issue of adverse impacts. Um, Commissioner, would you accept the key finding at number eight of Mr. Penman's report that the group established by the Garda Síochána itself to provide strategic oversight recognized that some cancelled incidents may have resulted in serious risk or harm to individuals? Well, yes, and um, indeed that was uh, very much our immediate concern um, to find uh, those um, were, were either, as it says, where there was either harm caused or actually an on a serious ongoing risk. That, that was a real focus of the work, yeah. And, and do you also accept then the finding further on in the report at um, number 14 that there were incidents where the information that was gathered was gathered incorrectly and that had the result of Gardy attending the incorrect address 
and that the callers in those instances could not be recontacted. Re and would you agree that that is a very serious adverse impact? Well, um, in terms of the service that we provided, like we failed to provide a, we failed to provide a, um, a service. Um, and, and there are a, there are a number of individuals that we still have to make contact with. Uh, we have flagged them all on our system so that we come in, in contact with people through any other means that then we can immediately follow through in terms of uh, our engagement around this process. But there, um, there are a group, small group, um, that uh, in, in respect of domestic abuse where we haven't been able to make contact so we have no means of actually knowing what happened to them uh, other than um, they're beyond our reach. Uh, at times, details were taken down incorrectly or you know, wrong addresses were uh, recorded. And that should have been, uh, whenever that was clear, whenever the respondent uh, patrol went to the scene, uh, then further work should have happened around trying to determine where the call actually came from for inquiries instigated and that didn't happen. And so we do recognize that as a very serious failing. And, and, and I suppose in those cases, it's impossible to rule out that there may have been physical harm in those cases. You, you've no way of ruling that out, do you? No, there's no way of ruling that out. We haven't made contact, so we don't know actually what happened to them, what was happening to them in the night and what's happened to them subsequently. And, um, it, but there's a, uh, there's a group that we haven't been able to make contact with it's, and uh, that's ongoing and concern I, I, but as I say we've, we've tried what we've done is, is have them all on our system so if we come in contact with them any other sphere then uh, we'll know immediately but part of the presumption is uh, that some of them may have actually left the jurisdiction as well. And, and, and do you also accept then the finding at number 24 that there was no consistency across the Gardaí, Garda Shiokana organisation as to what consists or constitutes an adverse impact to victims as a result of cancelled incidents? Um, to, if I might turn to uh, AC Cagney just in respect of the, the, the element around uh, adverse impact, Certainly what, what we were searching for were those who um, suffered harm, but also was ongoing uh, risk and making sure that when we engage with them, that we were mitigating that as far as possible and making sure then that we were following through in terms of investigation and intervention to protect them. Uh, and, the, and, and that was in part our uh, main part of our focus. And, and when we started this, obviously we had real concerns that people had suffered either harm or were at the risk of ongoing harm. But uh, if I turn to Anne-Marie, please, just in respect of, of the adverse impact, please. Yeah, thanks, Commissioner. And thanks, Shalom. Uh, I suppose, Shalom, you and I both understand that the understanding right across the sector um, of adverse impacts is very difficult to define. And I think that's really important to recognise that what one considers to be adverse impacts is not necessarily what, what another agency would consider. And I think what's important about the work of Angarda Shiokana in this particular space is that we uh, developed from the beginning an understanding that adverse impacts and an assessment of adverse impacts was going to form part of every aspect of each of the stages of the CAD review. Um, so from that stage one right through to stage six, we introduced methods of assessment, uh, you know, and we agreed on those. And that's why we had such a particular focus on vulnerable victims and to try and identify any risks and harms that would come to uh, persons as a result of the, the CAD review process. Part of our approach, as you're aware, was to engage early with the women's aid to gain their support from an external perspective as to the approach we were taking. And at all stages of our approach, they were very much supportive of the approach we had taken. Notwithstanding that, we engaged the services of the Garda National Protective Services Bureau, both during the CAD review and in the delivery and the development of the subsequent training with a particular focus on adverse impacts. And indeed, we ourselves as a senior management team really drove that particular understanding right from the top 
right down to the teams on the ground. And again, that resonated even in the identification and choice of the individuals that we chose to engage with uh, victims in our communities. So, so it, it's really uh, that that high. Sorry, Assistant Commissioner, if there's no, if the finding in the report is that there's no consistency as to what is an adverse impact, I mean, how can the guards look into what adverse impacts there have been and what reassurances can we have in terms of what the adverse impacts were or weren't when there's no consistency in that, in that uh, approach? Thanks, Shalom. And I think the wording that was used was actually a shared understanding as opposed to lack of consistency. Yeah, no, you're, you're right. That is, that is the a shared understanding is our, our Mr. Penman's words. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I suppose that's the discussion I'm having with you in the sense of what we consider to be our understanding of the approach we took to identifying and supporting individuals and vulnerable persons who were subject of the CAD review. And I think that's particularly important. We place significant emphasis on that right from the start, and we still to do to this day, even in terms of the individuals that we haven't been able to engage with. And the commissioner mentioned the uh, uh, items of interest that we have put on our pulse system so that in the future, we may be in a better position to engage with those individuals. And that's how important this is to us. Okay. And, and but do you accept then Mr. Penman's finding that some victims um, will have experienced detriment? Well, if I might come in there, um, I think I'm accurate in saying that we had a consistent approach to victims. Um, I think it's a 38 stage approach that we had uh, to each of them. Um, there is, um, well, and I'll go back to what I said at the very start, we didn't provide the service that we set out to. And the service that we set out to provide to um, those uh, victims of domestic abuse is built on good, strong policy and practice in terms of actually calling the follow on in terms of investigation and the, the callback, et cetera. All, these, all, of, all of these things are in effect the service you need to provide to make sure that you're doing your utmost to protect an individual from the events as they are of the, of the, of the, the time of the incident, but also the subsequent. So where we've not done that, that is obviously to an individual's detriment. We may have missed the opportunity um, for um, a prosecution or for the pursuit of a barring order being breached as well. So that's obviously to an individual's detriment. What we've done, I think, is as best we can, reviewed the, review the years of, of 2019 and 2020 and re-engaged um, where we've been able to and to make sure then that people are aware of the services that we provide and obviously then to come back to us immediately if there's any, if there's further reoccurrence or need or insistence in any way whatsoever. But we can't recreate 2019 or, or in terms of our initial response and some of the opportunities um, may have been lost. Okay. And uh, Commissioner, do you agree uh, with Mr. Penman's finding that some members of uh, the Garda Siakana requested dispatchers to cancel calls or incidents? And do you accept that that had uh, the effect that it avoided the need for follow up by those members? Well, uh, yes, I uh, will. By, by dint of asking for, a, for an incident to be cancelled, then it didn't move across the pulse, so follow up didn't happen then. And that's an element of the review that we the, of when the, an element that the review uncovered. And do you do you think that that was the motivation behind the request to cancel calls? Um, I'm not clear what the motivation was. The behaviour um, is as described though, and the consequence was then that follow ups didn't happen. And whether uh, that was their motivation or not, but it, in, what it opened up then was risk, and it opened up. Um, the possibility and actually the actual that we didn't provide the service that was required. Okay, and just to finish up then on, on the adverse impact uh, uh, section of my questioning, I mean, would you accept that the adverse in impacts go way beyond not giving people a pulse number as was suggested at one stage? Well, I'd, um, I don't think that I've ever suggested that adverse impacts no. are just released. Just you, you, you only didn't, to in fairness a, to you. A pulse incident. Well, yeah, and so I, I don't, I, I see that 
you know, if it, we um, we have probably come to an agreed definition of adverse impact. But part of that adverse impact has been that uh, one, uh, we weren't there to, um, we didn't find incidents when we should have looked harder, made further inquiry and, there, and therefore then been there on the night. And there was also other incidents where we, uh, we haven't been able to follow through on, for instance, breach of barn orders, et cetera. But also then we didn't provide the ongoing support that individuals um, uh, are entitled to in terms of just our, our victim support. So the adverse impacts uh, have, have a range of just practical uh, impacts for individuals. So, um, and we entirely understand that and recognize that. Thank you. And uh, if I could move then on to the area of call recording and you, and you have answered some questions, but this is an important area because I, I think the report identifies that in or around 25% of the calls that were incorrectly canceled were made directly to local stations. And I think you're, you're aware from what's gone before that these calls are not recorded. And I wonder in, in those circumstances, how can you say definitively that all of those calls were answered in the first place? Uh, well, the, well, the calls were answered because they were, they were placed, on, uh, placed on CAD. But how do you know that, I mean, they may not have ever got that far if they were not answered. I mean, well, if you have no call recording system, how do you reconcile the numbers of calls that are, are taken, but maybe not answered then? Well, um, well, calls that are taken and then not put onto CAD. So then, then in effect, there's no, there's no official record um, of a call being made to the station. Well, uh, Mr. Penn highlights that um, as a risk uh, one of the mitigations then in respect of that may be in terms of recording all calls to assistance to um, uh, local stations. Uh, we, we, we just, I think we just need to do some more work on that because the, okay. that takes you down a different route, I think, inevitably ar around a non-emergency number. And uh, I have to weigh that up in terms of the end of our local relationship, our relationship with local communities. And their ability to look at a station and see um, a guard uh, present and want to speak to that individual that they that they might know or have a relationship with. So there's a balance between our local engagement and uh, the issues that are that arise here. The, the difficulty is we can't actually quantify the calls that were made and never made it on the CAD. Anything anything that comes on the CAD, we do know about it and we know them. We can follow the audit trail of whether it stayed on CAD or whether it moved on to Pulse and then what the follow through of it was. Okay. And do you accept though in principle that the inability to play back calls in made for emergency purposes, that that has an adverse impact on the Garda Shilkana's ability to manage those incidents? So for example, in a say domestic violence assault, a person may have to hang up abruptly the person taking the call may have wanted to clarify something and, and the ability to play back that call might be of huge assistance to them in following up. Uh, and that's the very reason that we do record the Travel 9 system so that we're mm. able to go back and listen back. And yes, it's undoubtedly an impediment if you receive such a call local station that you're not able to actually to rehearse the call. And, and even uh, in, in recent months, there's been instances where it's been very useful actually just to be able to replay the call, to hear exactly um, what was said and what the exchange uh, might might have been. So that is um, that's that's a you know a disadvantage of the local the local station call system, undoubtedly. And I think you agreed at an earlier meeting that there is an issue sometimes with quality of call taking, and when you listen to some of the recordings yourself, that that you've agreed that there were issues with that. In terms of the calls made to local stations, is there a real problem and a risk in that there can't be any quality assurance because they can't be listened back to by anybody performing any quality assurance task? Um, I might just, I might turn to AC O'Brien here and just um, in terms of our, just our overall call handling policy. But what I would say is the local stations, Probably is a good deal less fraud environment compared with the command control um, environment where uh, all the um, 
the travel nine calls are, are coming into and sometimes you know uh, very fraught and difficult calls being uh, dealt with uh, I would highlight the the training that we've engaged in but and and but also then the individual feedback sessions and the retraining that we've also engaged in as well um, but uh, being a call taker on a travel nine system is isn't an easy task at times and in fact at times it's an incredibly difficult task well actually but, one of my before you you pass me on to 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 uh, assistant commissioner o'brien one of my questions was going to be are, are people who take those calls in stations are they trained to the same level as the personnel in control rooms in terms of taking a, you know emergency calls for emergency services um, well, they, they want to. They want to have been through the four-week course plus uh, the refresher training that would have been provided to call takers and dispatchers. But um, if it turned AC O'Brien, you may know of the training package that is provided and just the the, the policy in respect of the local station use. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Yes, the, 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 first of all, the, the training provided to the emergency services, as, as has been alluded to, is a detailed four-week course in terms of call handling and the technical dispatch. The training that was required in respect of the local stations and the purpose of that was to deal with local issues, generally priority two and three, is around the, the call taking and the technical recordings of CAD. Uh, and that was a, a, a two-day course for the individuals who were identified on each of the units across the organization located in district headquarters. The difficulty is that, that our 999 system is our emergency call handling service to deal with emergencies. And we are always at pains to, to in any uh, occasions, to advertise that fact to the public that in the event of an emergency, the, the appropriate direction is via 999 as opposed to to a local station so we have for for decades endeavored to do that to to channel all emergency calls to our emergency call service notwithstanding that the reality is in in ireland uh, the local communities have a very close relationship with their stations and on occasion will gravitate naturally to the station for uh, for the service and there are some calls that will they will naturally gravitate them to the station, including some emergency calls. So again, it's it's how we deal with that and the call handling. And, and the way that happens is that the call itself, if there is an emergency or priority one, is automatically channeled to the regional control room so that the regional control room take, take ownership. So if somebody makes a call, even though we don't have the recording, if it is a domestic incident, that is automatically the system defaults it to the regional control room, and it is the regional control room that manages that call, notwithstanding the fact that it has come into the station. Uh, the, the issue of the non-recording is a vulnerability, but the system is designed to deal, to channel all emergency calls through to uh, the emergency control rooms, who are the individuals who are specifically trained to deal with emergencies and to handle emergencies. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and could I just ask one last question on that part of the call recording? Um, and back to you, Commissioner. Do you accept that the lack of recording facilities can lead can lead to a loss of evidence in some cases, and that sometimes, for example, in in serious cases, the call to a station or the call 999 call is actually used as evidence in, in cases. So the lack of that facility could le lead to a loss of evidence. Um, that, that, is, that, is a, that is a risk. Um, and this was documented in the Family Commission. And um, I think for us to move to a step where we're recording all calls for assistance into a local station, we, we would need specific um, legislation, um, and that was that was their observation. Uh, it is very intrusive. You're ringing a treble nine call. I think it, you know there's an expectation there that um, you've rang the emergency system. There'll be a recording made, but people ring their local station for a whole variety of reasons. Undoubtedly, some to report a crime, and the, the report the recording would be very important. Well, invariably, a lot of the other matters would be at level two and level three, and just even just local inquiry. Um, and, uh, 
I'm not you sure must if be I aware of those. That. You must be aware of that problem since at least 2017. I don't mean you personally, but as an organisation, you must be aware of the problem since at least 2017 when the Fennelly Commission reported. And, yeah, and, and there is a legislative lacuna around um, the recording of calls into um, local stations. But it, there also is that the, I think there is a balance between um, people's uh, privacy and and uh, the recording of calls, which are just routine interactions with with Gardaí around all sorts of of uh, everyday events. I, I think the Family Commission did recognise that there was a benefit to those calls to stations being recorded, and your own Garda HQ directives also recognised the need for calls, um, emergency calls to be recorded going back, I think, to 2016-17. So, you know, this has been recognised for a long time and it doesn't seem that anything has been done about it in, in all of those years. Uh, but we do record the treble nine calls. They're yeah, still, but you don't still record it. But you're aware that, you know, up to 25% of calls, you know, it, in this review that were cancelled were to stations. So you must be aware that a significant number of calls for emergency services start like as a as a call to a local station, and that they're not recorded, and that that was a need that was identified in Fennelly in 2017, and by your own directives going back to I think 2016-17. Well, um, on the basis of the report that we've received now from Mr. Penman for yourselves, maybe we can we can take another uh, view on this. Um, but it, it becomes then part of a wider question about how genuinely um, members of the public make contact with Vanguardia Chicana. I think it does, and, and I'm, I'm going to come to that because I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what, what, um, what's going to happen now. Um, and, and I suppose before I ask you anything else, I mean, could I ask you what are the big lessons that you've learned from this review? And, and I know you've only had the final review for a short time, but you have had the draft for a little longer, so maybe maybe there are some lessons that have been identified by the review and the report. Well, um, I think some, some of the things have already um, been touched upon um, in terms of just uh, we're placing quite often um, the, the things that trip, trip you up are the day-to-day -day as opposed to the big incidents, but it's the day-to-day -day and it's the ongoing need just around the supervision um, and that's fr first line supervision, but also then the ongoing governance uh, around these. Uh, so within Garda Chicana, like we have good public servants working hard, and uh, and I don't and I'm not seeking to minimise this in any way. We just have to think around what their behaviours were, how they then you know went so far off track that uh, we were left with these circumstances, and then how we resolve that. I think we've done a lot in terms of just the engagement with the staff, the focus that's been placed on this. But I think it's just an end part of our wider work around uh, the culture in the organisation, the culture around service uh, delivery, and the culture around um, keeping people safe, and particularly those who are most vulnerable. So there are a lot of wider lessons about, um, I think, uh, behaviours uh, and perhaps the attitudes that underlie them, but certainly the behaviours which are illustrated perhaps in this, where we have a policy which says, you know, no matter if the person rings back and cancels, still somebody should go out because the individual, you know, frankly could be talking under the threat of coercion, um, et cetera. So do call and make sure they're okay. And that, that doesn't happen. And that, that uh, in effect, it could be a reckless act, but certainly it was an act well outside um, our procedures. So uh, I think there's a behavioural piece there that we want to address, and part of that has been through training and interaction, part of it's through supervision, but part of it then is just around uh, governance as well. But I suppose then, when you know that, then where else is just, you know, our routine work, which may also then throw up uh, really big risks for us. So it is, there's, a, there's a wider point about just how our routine day-to-day -day work can throw up, you know, huge strategic risks for us in terms of just risk to the members of the public and uh, reputational risk. Okay, and, and, and Mr. Penman in his report states that 
there's an unprecedented opportunity for the Garda Siakana to develop a comprehensive strategy and roadmap for national communication command and control that go beyond the planned rollout of CAD 2. I mean, would you see that yourself, that this is an opportunity for a sort of root and branch look at the entire system from the initial contact to the guards right through to the call taking, call dispatching, the attendance by the guardy, the proper closure of the case with proper follow-up procedures. Do you see that yourself, that this is really a massive opportunity and, and that this maybe the so-called or the, the measures that have been taken so far are, are really only sticking plaster fixes, like the technical fix really didn't work, I think, if, if you honestly look at it. The increased or change of supervision that clearly didn't work when we continued to have problems. And, you know, the, the um, other measures that have been put in place, they just haven't been up to the task. So would you agree that this is uh, an unprecedented opportunity to create a system that gives the victims who call and people who are in distress who call a, a service that's fit for purpose and, and one which I think, you know, you yourself have said they should have expected a better service or something. I'm sorry, I'm par paraphrasing you there, but yes. something along those lines. Yeah, well, uh, we, we entirely ex uh, accept that this is a, a very important opportunity for us. Um, and it's come in some ways uh, at an opportune time for us in that uh, our, CAD 2, our CAD 2 processes are being worked up and CAD 2 will be rolled out in uh, probably the next 11 to 12 months. So this is, a, this is an important opportunity for us. I think the wider point then, just overall, uh, that this is the first, and we recognise it properly as being the first point at which the public make contact with Angarda Shikana and that sort of realisation of the importance of that contact. I think Pillar 2, perhaps that uh, wasn't emphasised sufficiently. Um, there was a lot of emphasis on the uh, responding uh, patrol, etc. Whereas the first point of contact was through either the Treble Nine system or through or to the local station. So there is a there is an opportunity here, and I know myself and I know all my colleagues are entirely engaged uh, with the report and then seeing what else um, uh, we can do. Uh, the there are in, in effect some open ended recommendations there as well that we just need to consider. And I would like the opportunity to in effect make a and then Garda Shikana response um, to, the, to the report, which then we can hopefully set out what our vision for, uh, you know, the contact command control uh, will look like going into the future. We look forward to seeing it. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you, Shalom. Uh, before asking if anybody else has any, uh, any other member has any questions to ask in this, I wonder if I could ask you a couple of brief questions, uh, Commissioner. In your response to Moling Ryan, uh, you spoke about accepting recommendations that you've just done again now, recognizing that some of them are far reaching and, and you want to reflect on them and, and submit a, a, a response from the organization. And uh, as Shalom said, that's perfectly proper and we look forward to that. Do you accept the findings uh, of uh, Mr. Penman's report? Oh, uh, yes, we accept uh, the, the findings and uh, that uh, the, the summary of key findings, which which uh, are across the first three pages. Yep. Yes, indeed. No, yes. Thank, thank you. That, that's uh, that's an important um, that's an important statement. And, and thank you for making it. The second quick point I wanted to is just touching on the issue of local stations, because I, for one, was surprised by the number of calls. Um, the, the high percentage of calls that came into local stations and were transferred to the CAD system thereafter. But picking up on a point that Shalom made, we, we all know that every 999 call is answered. Nobody's ever suggested otherwise. And then the relevant ones are passed on by ECAS to the relevant service, those that relate to the Garda Shikona to yourselves. Are you confident or can you be confident, is it possible to be confident that every call that is ever made to a Garda station is always answered? Um, I might turn to uh, AC O'Brien just to, because uh, I 
I couldn't say that off the top of my head. Maybe um, Barry's able to give some more assurance about that. And maybe it's an impossible assurance to give, but then... Yeah, well, it may be. It, uh, yeah. it, 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 it may be, but... I have to say all manner of calls are made to local stations. Exactly. Uh, uh, Barry, are you able to give any assurance just about calls to local stations, please? Uh, I can give assurance of the respect of the emergency calls on the 999 because our system is geared for that. But if you look at the whole variety of calls that are made to guard the stations, be it business to business, you know, um, people calling the station and that, um, that they're answered, I, I, given the volume of calls, I, I cannot honestly give an assurance that every single call is answered. And one of the difficulties we have always encountered is the, the, the resourcing of the front, front of house. And that is that having people, uh, sufficient resources, but no more than sufficient resources to deal with call answering in the station, call transfer, and dealing with the calls to the public. So. A little bit like the Commissioner, uh, from a technical point of view, I couldn't give an assurance that every single call that is ever made to every single guard station in the state is answered. Yeah, and, and, th thank, and, and I'm not asking it with the view to, to being smart or to scoring a point or to trapping anybody. I'm just saying that because in, inevitably, I think nobody could expect you to give such an assurance because how could you know and how could anybody know? But doesn't it ex identify a particular risk, though, in relation to the fact that if there, if it's possible that some calls are just not answered, pressure, whatever it may be, somebody's absent from the office, isn't there a risk that included in those unanswered calls are calls from people who are seeking urgent help and who, who may not then go on to do what might have been the obvious thing, one would say in the first instance ring, 999 but because they they make contact with the local station which is commendable and really good doesn't it expose that risk but the chair would say we but we can't actually quantify that risk you know the travel nine emergency system is well known it's decades old um if somebody is in dire straits and they can't get a call can't get an answer from the local station we would hope that then they would go to the the travel nine system it, it, um and uh, so the, the, there is a there is a there's a quandary here in how we proceed because I, I don't know what system. Well, there are systems if, if we if we went to a non-emergency number and uh, uh, some call centre then demand manage non-emergency numbers and then they identify an emergency then that passes straight over. Mm -hmm. But the CAD system was designed to do that so that you receive an emergency call on anything other than the Treble 9 system, you quickly then transfer it into CAD and it goes into relevant yeah. command control. No, and, and as, I, I, just identifying the fact that there's a dilemma here, recognising the dilemma that the organisation faces, um, and it, but it does probably uh, reinforce the point that Derek Penman makes that there is a risk for the organisation, there is an exposure. Um, simply because of the unknown. I know it's unquantifiable and I'm not, as I say, trying to be, I'm just teasing out an issue that has the potential to be significant um, while acknowledging that I, I have nothing approaching an answer to it. The other question I wanted to ask you, Commissioner, is this. Um, you have yourself spoken um, a number of times about the risk to the organisation from the fact that um, incidents were cancelled uh, and uh, calls weren't adequately responded to. And it is something of a miracle, it is definitely a mercy, uh, that the number of cases of significant physical harm or risk to an individual is, as far as can be ascertained, um, a, a small number. But do you think that the risk that the very act of improperly or unwarrantedly cancelling an incident implies, do you think that's appreciated throughout the organisation at this stage? Well, I think um, given the emphasis that we've placed on this, the emphasis um, uh, with the control room staff, the retraining, the personal engagement, um, 
Also now we have appointments made uh, for discipline investigations. There's been a huge focus on this and, and I would also commend all the regional ACs for their huge focus on this throughout the last um, now, well, 12 months really. So um, I think the appreciation of what cancellation actually means and what it should be used for um, is on far sounder footing and also then a greater appreciation of the vulnerability of people um, and uh, how this should be dealt with over the phone and following through on our policies and that our policies have been written for a purpose there. There's good reason that, that we wrote the uh, domestic abuse policy in the manner in which we did because we wanted to, as far as we could, mitigate very obvious things that can, that can go uh, very badly wrong in terms of dealing with those incidents. So um, I, I think we're in a different place so, uh, than we were uh, 18 months ago, but I also I'll just point to the, you know, the organizational response overall to domestic abuse, uh, the number of prosecutions there were last year for domestic abuse incidents, breach of bar and orders, and our rate of callback and also that our local protective services units are spread um, across uh, the whole of the jurisdiction. No, that is completely and, and, and fully acknowledged and understood and, and frequently reiterated by the authority. Thanks, Commissioner. Valerie, and then I think Stephen. Thanks, Chair. It, it seems to me, not just in this discussion, but from various co conversations we've had over our 100 meetings, that the, the, we, 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 we have a theme of criticising supervision in the Garda Síochána, and yet it seems to me that sometimes the supervisory capacity is, is a big challenge. I think, I think the job of a sergeant must be very difficult in terms of what we hear about management information being readily available. So it seems to me you have operational processes and operational systems like CAD and like PULSE, but, but the gap seems to be in anybody either having the curiosity or the capability, I don't know if it's one or the other, to be able to look at data and see what are the trends here. So I'm thinking of a sergeant who has any number of Gardaí working on their team. They're out in cars, they're out on foot, and quite rightly, out around the community. So the capacity to supervise seems to me to be quite difficult. And what strikes me is in this instance, it was it was a very commendable uh, chief superintendent who who uncovered this issue and obviously must have looked at data, looked at trends and surfaced the issue. So I'm wondering why that isn't happening more across the organisation when these kind of issues are coming up. Is that learning not there that that a sergeant needs some kind of a dashboard that says what's going on in my patch? over the last week, over the last month? Is there an inconsistency with other areas? Or that a superintendent can't look across the district? Or that you, Commissioner, can't look across the whole organisation and see what are the norms and are there oddities here? And, and even just out of curiosity, just imagine the things that might go wrong from a risk point of view and be able to pull off data. So I, I'm, I'm wondering, is there any thinking around that? And I do appreciate the lack of investment in systems and the difficulties and the clunkiness of joining up data, etc. But I'm wondering, is there is there anything you can learn from this and some other matters we discussed earlier, like court appearances, like various activities that Gardaí are involved in? Is, is there any way that you can fast track an improvement in managers having the information and the data they need to manage operational trends? Um. Thanks, thanks very much, Barry. If, if I might turn to Andrew, please, just if Andrew can just maybe set out just what our ambition is around uh, the management data, certainly from CAD to the RDMS system, a uh, investigation management system. Uh -huh. uh, so we have various systems which are in the process of being rolled out. Uh, but um, you, are, you are correct, like, you know, the headlights of information are, are pretty dim at times when one's looking forward. But if I could just, if I can turn to Andrew just to see what, uh, say what our ambition is in respect of this. Thanks, Andrew. Br briefly, please, yeah. Andrew. Yeah, I'll try and keep it uh, brief. <clears throat> so as you know, Valerie, our, our overall mission is, is information-led uh, policing, and that's exactly the, the goal of our information. I, I, I'd like, if I may, I'd like you to tell the sergeant on the ground in a very busy station tonight 
what's coming down the tracks and when, so that they don't feel they're being accused by the public of making mistakes all the time. Okay. So as you, as you know, we have a costed um, plan, which is roughly about 200 million to implement uh, fully information-led policing. So at the current rate of investment, that will take about 10 years. So CAD 2 will come on stream, as the commissioner said, beginning the end of next year, that will improve the, uh, the information that they, have, um, that they have available to them. That will take about six months to roll out. So we're about 18 months away from having um, the kind of information that, uh, that, 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 that you refer to there. And just, uh, you know, just when it comes back to curios curiosity, there's enormous uh -huh. curiosity on the part of, of the frontline uh -huh. managers, uh, from myself, from the commissioner, uh, in getting access to this data. But it does take time and it does take investment. This is not an easy matter uh, to roll out enterprise class uh, data systems, uh, uh -huh. you know, given, the, uh -huh. given the level of, um, of investment. So uh, the answer to your question is about 18 months, I would say. For I, I, and, that, and that's really good to hear. And I, I, I think, I mean, because I think the conundrum is we know that Gardaí are by training and by nature curious. It's, it's, you know, detection is the nature of your business. And yet there seems to be this gap in detecting trends that surface issues like the ones today. And, yeah. and it, it's, it, it's really good that this issue was surfaced. It's unfortunate that it's happened, but it's really good that it's surfaced. Your own investigation has been extremely thorough and that's been borne out by Mr. Penman's investigation. So I think that's to be really welcomed. Um, I, would, I would like to say, I suppose, with my colleagues that we do recognize the efforts made by so many supervisors and guards right through the system. And it, it must be sometimes demoralizing to hear a matter like this aired, but it's really, really important that it is aired and that it's addressed and, and that we move on from it. So I'd like to thank you all for the what you've given us today. And there's more in this road to travel, I'm sure. But it's very heartening if, that you're saying 18 months is a time period within which we should see progress there. It's 18 months for CAD 2. The overall, yeah. the, the yeah. overall yeah. modernization will take about 10 years. Oh. Current yeah. rate, which probably never will be achieved after the current yeah, rate. It well, it's a, it's a moving target too. But thank you yeah. for that. Okay, thanks, Chair. That's, that's a much longer challenge. Thanks, Valerie. Uh, Stephen and then Elaine. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Commissioner, if we can return to the, the, the subject of uh, the risks that have been identified with about a quarter of the calls going into uh, local stations. You touched upon uh, the issue of a non-emergency number. Uh, obviously, that does exist in many other jurisdictions. Um, but you, you identified a potential tension in your mind between the introduction of a, that number and the relationship which you cherish between local guardy and local communities. But obviously there's benefits in a, in a non-emergency number, but you're saying there's a trade-off. Could you talk a little bit more about that, about your, your thinking around a non-emergency number and that trade-off? So um, we have very strong local relationships uh, with 570 stations, and there's a proportion of those are smaller stations, uh, not huge amounts of staff in them, some of them just one or two guards, but some of them then in around you know, maybe uh, half a dozen to a dozen guards in them. And that's, that's you know, that's a pretty uh, common pattern, uh, certainly across rural Ireland. Um, we place a lot of store on that in terms of, or a lot of weight on that, in terms of that local connection and providing uh, local assurance and uh, local uh, visibility. And I do think part of that, and we'd, we'd want to be sure around this, is that people feel they can you know, ring their local Garda station and uh, they will speak to someone they're familiar with. Uh, I do think um, a non-emergency number then lends you towards a call centre uh, and it lends you then towards perhaps a service which does, doesn't feel quite so personal. And, and I think before we would um, would embark on that, well, one, it's a huge investment there, but secondly, then, um, we'd like to have some sense of what uh, the public's or the JPC's feed feedback would be on this. Because um, I do think that our particular delivery model around community policing in rural areas, but in our towns as well, is one based on where where people are at least familiar with uh, with who their guardy are, and you know, lift the phone, expecting to talk to someone uh, that they have some uh, past and acquaintance with, as opposed to an entire uh, complete stranger. Um, so, uh, 
the non-emergency number then uh, is is a different is a different beast than that. People just ring then that constantly for whatever uh, service it might be. It might be put through to an extension or maybe for service delivery. Uh, and I just want I'd want to be in I want just to balance that up before I would um, make a in effect what is pretty sizable and in effect irreversible decision because if you make a, the investment in non emergency number and a call center. I think it's pretty like it's a very substantial investment both in capital and personnel to deliver that but uh, the other thing i would say and uh, we haven't touched upon it we're moving towards um guard of staff taking on the, the front desk type roles so there's pro probably more training that we can provide them in terms of uh, dealing with calls and particularly call recording and then dealing with calls which are obviously uh, emergencies as well so there, there's more that we'll have a discrete band of staff who will be doing this function in effect, well, 24-7, as it will be working 24-7. Um, and uh, that, that's a discrete band of people that we can provide for further expertise and training to and uh, monitor how, what their performance is. The other thing I would say is, um, I think like unlike uh, the United Kingdom, there is no lawful business monitoring type legislation. So the lawful business monitoring you see um, doesn't have a, a legislative uh, equivalent here, and th that would be uh, new legislation that we require um, to, I think, for the recording of routine engagement with the public over um, the non-emergency telephone system. Okay, thank you. And, and thank you, Commissioner. I think you've uh, opened a number of interesting lines of thought and inquiry for yourselves in that, and it's important to say that uh, Derek Penman identified a risk without prescribing a particular solution to it. And I think you've, 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 as I say, opened up a range of possibilities, Elaine, and then we're going to have to move on to our final item. Uh, yes, I'll, I'll be uh, quite brief. Uh, Commissioner, you've said to the chair that you accept uh, the findings, the summary of key findings. Um, do you have the Pelman report in front of you? I do, yes. Um, could you go to uh, page two and uh, number 15, and could you read that out for me, please? Uh, don't ask the man to read it out. I'll read it out. There are cancelled incidents where the Gardaí calling members responded and provided a service to victims. However, in some cases, members requested dispatchers to cancel incidents and avoided initiating follow-up activities. Uh, Commissioner, what do you take to mean uh, avoided initiating follow-up activities? Well, I think that's the practical uh, impact of when you go to a call. Uh, it's been classified as um, uh, domestic abuse and therefore then there should have been a range of follow-ons from that and by requesting that it's cancelled then that in, that in effect does close down the um, the, the callback services that we uh, would provide and and as said um, I can't talk to the motivation that, that was uh, engaged there but the behaviour certainly uh, was one which was outside of policy. So if the incident is cancelled, uh, there's no pulse record. And if there's no pulse record, there's no seven day callback. That, that's correct. And that's uh, uh, part of the domestic abuse uh, intervention policy number 11.5C that the guards uh, must abide by. So by cancelling the call, there was no obligation on the guardee to have a seven day callback to the, to the, guard, to the uh, person at the other end of that call. Uh, and, and precisely, and, and I suppose that there's other impacts uh, as as well, because then um, that call wouldn't have been picked up at the uh, divisional meetings, which uh, under, look at the performance of, uh, uh, the well, the ongoing performance meetings at divisional level. And also then, should there be subsequent incidents, this incident could have been lost in terms of the history that, uh, that um, uh, pertain to an individual. And that's important around if you want to pursue prosecutions around um, uh, um, course of control or else or to support applications for barn orders. So there's other consequences other than just we didn't engage in the uh, seven day callback. And I note that in the Guard Inspector report, the crime investigation report from 2014, uh, one of the recommendations was that follow up visits do not always happen in relation to domestic violence calls. And I note that 
uh, in November of this year, the Guard Inspectorate are having a major review into how the, t the Gardaí tackle uh, domestic violence. Um, do you think that's uh, warranted and welcome? Well, I would hope that we've moved on very significantly from 2014. I can point to a lot of things I've already touched upon during the meeting in terms of our advance uh, in the last seven years. We're very content for this um, uh, examination inspection to happen. Uh, and uh, again, it's another learning opportunity. Doubtless there'll be recommendations for us. This is a very important area uh, and it does, uh, regrettably, it's an increasing in incidence. Uh, there's more reports of this to us and we want to be sure that we're entirely at the top of our game in terms of responding, investigating and hopefully then preventing uh, further incidents. And I'm right in saying that Mr. Pedman did not have access to the calls, the council calls. Yeah, we know that. Well, uh, he's noted that within the report, and I know that uh, collectively we want to obtain legal advice. There is a, there is a, just simply a, the data protection issue that we want to be sure that we've resolved. And my final, it's more of an observation, but um, I'm right in saying then that it's not possible for Mr. Penman to deduce what the exchange was or whose calls were being cancelled? Well, uh, not so far, but I'd hope that we can resolve this as soon as possible. And then, um, really, I'm in your own hands about how you want to proceed then once, that's, once this is clarified. Thank you, Commissioner. Yeah, yeah. well, we all hope that the um, uh, legal counsel's opinion will, will be with us by the end of this week. And that will give greater clarity and we may have a clearer sense then of how we can how we can move forward uh, once that issue is, is resolved, if it is resolved. Thank you, Commissioner, and thank you to your colleagues um, for a, a, a very useful um, and comprehensive re review of the issues and for the nature of the responses both to the report and to the, the, the questions that colleagues have asked throughout this entire um, episode. Uh, we recognised the extent to which, once it was seized of this issue, the organisation um, put detailed resources into identifying uh, and, as I said earlier, forensically examining each and every one of those uh, uh, unwarranted cancellations. Uh, and uh, we have always appreciated that our key concern at the outset was that it took several months before the authority was made fully aware of the extent of the issue and of the of the nature and character of some of the uh, issues that were being cancelled. Uh, there, there's, there is a, a wealth of material um, for our future engagements, both in, in this preliminary report from Mr. Penman, and I've no doubt uh, that uh, once he has an opportunity to listen to calls, he will have a, a clearer report for us on issues relating to the quality of service, and which may in its turn raise issues of performance management, the kind of issues that uh, engage the organization's role as an employer and as a service provider. But for the moment, th thank you very much indeed for the responses to uh, today's questions. We're going to be running a little over time, uh, but I'm now going to ask uh, Paul McGean if he will lead on the questioning in respect of the uh, COVID-19 policing experience. Thanks, Chair. Um, and good afternoon, Commissioner and colleagues. Um, I've got a few questions on the policing of, of COVID and then a few questions on the uh, issue of spit hoods and the review that's um, currently in, in, uh, in train. Um, I think, Commissioner, you're aware of the fact that the authority has, uh, on uh, I think 15 occasions over the last year and a half, submitted reports to the Minister on the policing of the pandemic and I think it's fair to say that the tone of those reports in general has been very positive in relation to how uh, Garda Shikana has um, engaged with this uh, crisis um, and, as, and one aspect of that, one particular aspect of that has been the manner in which the Guards um, had a focus on working with communities um, and I know that Certainly, we've been reflecting um, in preparation for what we had hoped to think to perhaps be our final report to the minister, but I think that's probably unlikely now. Um, uh, on lessons that may have been learned over the course of the last 21 or 22 months. Um, and I know that you yourselves have been doing some work with the Police Service of Northern Ireland, looking back at how you've jointly approached the pandemic. 
And one of the interesting things I think from that report is that um, it's noted that one of the significant, in fact, I think the only significant difference in approach between the guards and the PSNI um, was the focus of the guards in supporting communities through the pandemic. And I think that's something that we as an authority should acknowledge again. Um, but I just wonder, given that this seems to be an opportune moment in terms of looking back and reflecting on the last 21 or 22 months, what do you see as the critical lessons learned on, on your part and on the part of, uh, of the guards overall um, from, from what you've had to face during the pandemic? Um, uh, thank you. Well, thanks very as well for uh, uh, your kind comments too in terms of our uh, response during COVID-19. Um, I, I think uh, one of the first things I would say is um, how quickly uh, we responded um, to what was emerging and um, how quickly we learned from what we could see, even um, in the Far East, uh, from the lessons that already were very apparent from countries like Taiwan, Japan, uh, Singapore, around some of the problems we might face. And then that became all the more uh, relevant and obvious as um, uh, COVID-19 and the pandemic started to take a grip in places like uh, Italy. And so um, we ourselves um, then decided on our four pillar approach. We were obviously given a, a policing role in terms of the health response uh, to COVID-19 and whether and to what degree we're ever asked again to support in effect, you know, the health campaigns around COVID-19 has uh, is yet to be seen. But there are lessons I think to be learned if uh, ever, um, uh, we face a pandemic type situation about uh, how we respond to this. I do think a central plank of it is around making sure uh, that we're visible, that we maintain our community focus, but also then uh, we recognize it as a time of being of great vulnerability. And that was very clear from both uh, the domestic abuse that uh, we quickly saw uh, the numbers start to rise, but also then uh, how organized crime uh, responds and responds very quickly to these circumstances as well. And uh, I think we kept pace with uh, we, we kept pace with that. I think a little, one of the longer term lessons is then about um, uh, the organization itself and its own uh, resilience and how it maintains um, its service delivery to the public. And I think we have fared well and probably fared better and perhaps um, some of our policing counterparts throughout the world in terms of just being able to maintain that uh, community ethos. Uh, I think we've avoided a lot of the contention that has been seen um, elsewhere uh, in the world, and, and that's been to our favour as well. It, you know, we've done a lot in terms of our internal communications, but also our external communications. And I think as well, like we could see an immediate need to provide you know, help and, you know, very tangible help in terms of even just groceries, et cetera, for those who uh, were either um, unable or uh, unable to leave their homes. And even if, if that meant going to pharmacy to collect mm -hmm. prescriptions, et cetera, all of that being done until other services, principally led by district council, started to pick, pick that up uh, from us as well. So I think um, there, was a, there was a lot about it, us just shouldering that, initial burden and then working in partnership with others then to help spread the burden and then as the situation eased then then we were able to retreat back into more of what our function was but while still maintaining that community uh, ethos as well so um there's a lot to learn from this uh but i would say you know there's a moment that's just there's ongoing issues for us as well and i talked about them earlier on like there's a lag and we've lost on a lot, huge amount of training and development opportunity. We have lost out um, in terms of, re of recruitment. We've kept going some of our change programs as the very best we could, but that we've been inhibited in doing some of our structural change. So, um, you know, it's not to say that we lost 18 months. We didn't. We've advanced in a lot of areas and advanced really well. But I think we, you know, we would have been in a different place if we'd been without COVID-19, um, obviously. But that's not the situation we find ourselves in, and we have to deal with the circumstances 
uh, as they are, not as they would as we'd wish them to be. Okay, I, I, thank you. And I think, um, as I indicated, um, you know that relatively positive view of how the guards have worked over the last eighteen months or so is borne out as well by the outreach work that we did, the authority did with community groups with victims of domestic violence um, and uh, NGOs, etc. But I suppose one thing that we wondered about was the lessons that you've learned in relation to working with communities at that very grassroots level, um, which, which lots of organizations said to us was a refreshing change, maybe from how they might have experienced policing in the past. How are those how is that good practice going to be retained in the future? Because as you say, you know, as 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 the hopefully as the emergency recedes, um, there is a risk that some of that good progress that has been made might unravel a little bit. And I'm just wondering, have you given thought or has the organization given thought to how you can retain and apply that good practice in the future? Um, uh, yes, and if I look to, um, I think, uh, Deputy McMahon might be best place to give an update on just you know the various forum that we've developed um, and uh, the work of um, uh, AC Hillman in this area as well, just to you know maintain and further enhance uh, some uh, those relationships. So, uh, Anne Marie, are you best placed? Yeah, uh, thanks, Commissioner. So, in the context of um, COVID and what we've learned from a community policing perspective. You know, you, you've articulated a lot of, um, you know, the positives, Paul. And um, in some ways, I suppose we were going back to back to basics, really, and back to the, the work and the connection that uh, that that was there and that was rekindled, I suppose, really. And um, many things uh, enabled us to do that. Um, first of all, there was an opportunity and an, and uh, and a, a desire that some, I suppose figure of authority would take control of the situation and be there and be helpful. So I, I suppose in many respects, that was just, um, you know, uh, telling us that people were wanted us to be there and were willing to engage with us. And we got a very positive response. And that, uh, I suppose, spanned a whole lot of areas from, as the commissioner has said, the basic, you know, providing the basic essentials. But also there were other calls then, you know, an opportunity opportunities where whether it was uh, Christmas or Easter well not Christmas but certainly Easter and Valentine's Day and all sorts of opportunities like that where um, the guards went and uh, connected with people and so the question is how do we how do we keep that going so I suppose in our policing plan as you've heard at the at the start of the meeting um, our focus on community policing is a key pillar of our next policing plan and indeed of our next strategy statement um, and that isn't to say that it's something new, but it's something that needs to be nurtured and something that needs to be invested in, and we're committed to doing that. So that ranges uh, all, uh, all the way from the community policing framework to the uh, retention of the community policing cars that were uh, a key feature uh, um, and bought uh, specifically at the start of um, of uh, COVID, so that is something that will will continue. In addition to that, you know, there is a um, you know an an investment provided in relation to um, uh, mountain bikes, and all that is about visibility and retaining that visibility. And in addition to that, then there's a whole lot of community groups that we are um, engaged in and continue to be engaged in. And some of them were a feature of COVID, and some of them. Um, or not. In addition to that, there's a number of diversity fora uh, developed right around the country. They will continue uh, with intensive engagement with uh, with JPCs and local authorities and, our, and the major emergency networks. Um, and again, they will continue. So there are lots of areas that will continue into the future. And I think uh, both um, guards and guard the management and uh, at the senior leadership uh, level recognize the importance of that and really i suppose um you know it doesn't it doesn't happen and it, it won't be retained unless it is nurtured and i suppose the commitment really is um as i've said in in both our policing plan and our strategy statement for the next three years is to continue with that 
And, and just to take that maybe Anne Marie one step further, I mean, I think that's all very positive. Um, but I think what what the authority picked up from its engagement with communities over the last year and a half is that actually the engagement between the guards and those communities that may in the past have had a slightly difficult relationship with, with the police um, went much deeper in the last 18 months than it would have before. And it didn't just involve um, representative groups, etc., that might be on diversity forums and things like that, but it actually went a bit beyond that. It was actually about engaging with you know, let's say travellers and halting sites or kids on local estates um, and that that relationship was a lot more positive than it had been. How do you retain, because that, that, that's, that's not about necessarily structure like the, the engagement for uh, you're talking about, it's about an attitude on the part of individual members of the service. Well, I suppose the, the, the four E's um, um, methodology and strategy that the Commissioner has alluded to, <clears throat> I suppose that um, that really took on a life of its own during COVID. And I think it's it's something that, that will remain with us as an approach uh, to our policing, because if you just take it in its simplest form, each of those um, E's represents, um, you know, a particular type of engagement. Now, it, you know, I suppose, as we've seen during COVID as well, um, on some occasions, you have to work your way through those four E's uh, in a much quicker way, depending on the prevailing situation. So I'm not saying that it can be all, uh, you know, as graduated as one, you know, as you might like, but, you know, because circumstances are different. So um, I do think we've learned a lot as an organisation in the context of how that approach worked. Um, you know, side by side with that, you know, we have um, um, a recruitment campaign that will be launched hopefully early in the new year. So our intention is to, um, and work has already commenced in the context of trying to bring that campaign to as diverse a range of an audience as possible and hopefully attract people from that. And, you know, we do plan extensive outreach in terms of um, um, engaging with and hopefully attracting uh, um recruits, if I can say that, uh, to, to from those various communities. And that, you know, we like we want to be representative of the, of the community that we're policing. And, you know, there is that that saying that, you know, you can't be what you can't see. So we need to start somewhere in that context. And uh, and we're committed to doing that. So so there's lots of things I suppose we can do. But that initial engagement on the ground and that, um, you know, um, that one-to-one -one interaction is really important and we're very, very seized of that. And I just wonder, and this, I'll, I'll just leave this part of it now, but I, I, I just wonder myself about, you know, when you next have an opportunity to train recruits or indeed in terms of ongoing training, whether some of that experience that your own people have had in the last 18 months can be captured in terms of actually the provision of training by some of them to say, this is how we dealt with this emergency and this is how we dealt with local communities. Um, so I'll, 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 I'll leave that thought with you. Um, Commissioner, the one thing that I noticed when looking at the stats um, that the authority has, has put together over the last um, 18 or 19 months is in terms of the fines that were um, uh, given out by the guards, um, I think about 23,000 FCNs but more than 50%, I think 52% were given to people aged between 18 and 25. Is there any reflection that you have on that? Is there a concern that there was perhaps an over-policing of that age group? Um, I, would, I, would need to be, I would need to dissect those figures a bit because the FCNs took a different character depending on what part of this various health emergency we were in so I would need to I would need to dissect that a little bit further um, in part some of that may just have been around and affect their visibility out and about but I just don't know Paul I, I really uh, a bit nervous about giving an off the cuff answer in, in respect of that um, and I, no, I don't that's, know that's, off the top of my head. That's fair enough if, if maybe we could come back to that yep. on another occasion but but you will recall I suppose that one of the I mean having having properly emphasised the, um, uh, the positives of the last uh, period of time. One of the concerns, I suppose, that the authority has had has been an apparent inconsistency in approaches to particularly things like uh, public order situations. So I think you'll remember that at other meetings we talked about 
the policing of the Debenhams protests um, and uh, what appears to have been a more relaxed attitude to, for instance, the, um, the sort of beach party in Salt Hill, etc. Again, now with the, the, the advantage of a little bit of time having elapsed, if we did face a similar situation again, is that, uh, is that an issue that would sort of exercise your mind? Do you think that there is a need to perhaps be more consistent in the future if we were to face a, a similar pandemic? Oh, well, um, I think overall in respect of public order um, and uh, whether in COVID pandemic or not, uh, the, circum the circumstances of what you know and when you know it do your, do your time will also uh, determine the policing response. So, and we've had, you know, recent situations where literally uh, we only became aware as events were unfolding and, and on other occasions then you have some uh, prior notice and uh, you know you can put a date and a time on an incident and you can you can create a or you can be aware then of what the risk is so um, re regrettably things may look to be inconsistent but they actually are uh, in effect a, a consequence of what we know and when we know and what the resources that we have um, uh, and how and or what resources we have available to deal with a situation so, um, in effect, you're dealing with either the spontaneous or the pre-planned, and uh, they they will look different. Uh, and that's that would be the situation now, and um, and would be the situation in the past as well. Never mind COVID. And just in terms of, in particular, I suppose maybe the the Debenhams protests. I mean, obviously, the police are in a difficult situation. You, on the one hand, you're having to try to enforce COVID regulations. On the other hand, you're trying to ensure that the right to peaceful protest is vindicated. Um, are you satisfied looking back that you struck the right balance in those in those instances? Well, if I take the, the wide expanse of the protest type activity that, that happened and uh, our efforts to facilitate protest as best as best we could, then there I am broadly content. You know, there will be incidents where you think, well, uh, we should review that, or maybe there might have been a different approach. But overall, like there's a very consistent approach in terms of uh, trying to facilitate uh, public public protest. And some of the some of these protests were happening uh, at the uh, at the really in the height of the powers around uh, lockdown and restrictions and movement. Still, we did our best to. Um, uh, facilitate those and uh, really our first approach was in line with uh, preventing public order disturbances or preventing crime. Okay, thank you. Commissioner, can I, can I move on? Um, and I know we're a little bit pressed for time. Um, can I move on to the issue of uh, uh, spit hoods? Um, I, I understand that um, I know there was a previous uh, evaluation of this and, and um, but now there's a there's a further review that you have uh, you have ordered, and I understand that's close to completion. Can you can you give us an update as to when we might receive it? Uh, well, um, I received it yesterday, so uh, I need to take a look at it and run through the executive because there is decisions to be made um, uh, in respect of it, and. Um, and uh, the next the next meeting's coming quite quickly. It may be with you then for the January meeting. And is there anything that you can tell us at this stage? Well, uh, I'm having to balance. Uh, you know, the concerns have been raised, and others have been uh, others have, have raised concerns about the, the use of anti spit guards, as we like to call them, and the actual then um, health and safety uh, obligations that are placed on. Uh, on me in respect of uh, giving the organisation the necessary equipment so that they can do their do their job safely, and uh, the anti spit guard uh, is an item which does protect uh, members of Angarda Shikana from spitting, uh, and uh, it, I have to I have to assess that and weigh the uh, balance that against. Um, uh, other uh, competing concerns there is in respect of the use of such equipment, but uh, we'll give it careful consideration and my colleagues now come to um, a decision in respect of it. 
And kind of just because I think that that goes to the sort of heart of the issue. Obviously, we recognise um, how uh, unpleasant, how difficult it must be for um, individual guards to be subject to that sort of behaviour or activity. But I think it's also correct to say that when these were introduced, or whatever we want to call them, but when they were introduced, the, um, uh, the clear message from, I think, from yourself and from the organisation was they were int introduced as a response to the pandemic. Um, and therefore, the expectation was that they would they would go with the end of the pandemic. But I'm just wondering, did the review, and I understand you have to consider it, et cetera, but one of the issues that arose in the course of the last 18 months was a concern that, in fact, these devices really didn't protect officers from um, the transmission of COVID um, and that there was a lack of robust data around that. Was that part of the review and was any further data, can you say, obtained or any further studies obtained? Well, um, well, well we accept what the manufacturer says in terms of uh, its limitations and their inability to give us any guarantee that it was going to protect from COVID-19. Um, the, but the issue is it does effectively protect from being spat on. So, um, and that's that's where I'm balancing the decision as opposed to the situation we find ourselves in in terms of a health pandemic of COVID-19. Um, yeah, I'm sure, Commissioner, you'll have seen the report that was published by the Police Ombudsman in Northern yeah. Ireland in relation to the use of the equivalent sort of um, equipment up here. Um, and uh, she made a number of recommendations about the deployment of these um, pieces of equipment, particularly in relation to young people. Has that formed part of your, or will that form part of your reflection on the report that you've received? Uh, well, uh, I have to say you have the advantage on me. I, I wasn't aware that the Ombudsman of Belfast had issued a report, but I will, I will seek it out then. Yeah, I'm sure we can, I'm sure you can, you can get that. I mean, she, as I say, her, her particular concern, I think, was, was, um, looking at instances when it was deployed in relation to young people. Thankfully, the number of those incidents um, in the Republic has been small, but there have, I think, been seven such incidents. Uh, and the authority, of course, particularly concerned in relation to those. Um, one final point in relation to this. Do you, can you say whether or not the report that you have received has been able to assess whether or not there was any disproportionate impact um, on certain groups or individuals from certain backgrounds in terms of the deployment of these uh, uh, these devices you, you know that I mean you know you know that um, well can I say it's quite a substantial report and it'd be wrong for me to sit here and suggest that I've read it and digested it because okay there's other things in front of my desk there uh, yesterday so I haven't done that. And I just need to take the time to to read it and um, uh, with the, together with the executive take a view on it. So I, I can't, in all honesty, I can't, Paul, I can't say that to you. Okay. I mean, I think some of the figures that the authority has been able to gather from its analysis of the reports that uh, Angarda Shikona have provided would certainly suggest that um, there may be issues in relation to individuals that officers identified as potentially having a mental health issue. Um, and I think I'm right in saying that 28 um, of the incidents, and I think there's roughly about 130 or 140 such incidents, uh, involved uh, individuals who uh, were not, uh, not Irish citizens. Um, so there may be an aspect of that that you would want to consider in the in the context of how you respond, but um, but I appreciate that you've just got the report, and maybe we can yeah. have a discussion uh, at the next meeting. Um, and sorry, one one very final point. Do you know, and it may be that maybe that you don't know this. I know the last time you did receive advice from the Garda uh, Human Rights Advisor. Um, do you know if there was a fresh piece of advice given in relation to this evaluation? Um. I don't know. Uh, I don't know. What I know is I've got a, quite a considerable report sitting there okay. to be read. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that's fine. Okay, thank you very much, Commissioner. We're sure we can revisit these issues again. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Chair. All right. Okay. Thanks, Paul, and thank you, 
Commissioner. Uh, I think that brings us to uh, the end of this meeting. Thank you for your um, generosity, all of you, in terms of the time, because we are nearly 20 minutes beyond our schedule, but I think it was very useful, very productive, uh, and right and proper that we <clears throat> gave the time that we did, particularly to the uh, discussion on um, the CAD 999 uh, issues and the Derek Penman uh, preliminary report. And as we've said before, more on that anon. So thank you, Commissioner, and to all of your colleagues, and thank you to our own authority colleagues uh, and uh, Helen and her colleagues for the preparation and for all of the elements of this evening's meeting, which is now closed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Nan.